All right, good morning, everybody. If you have a Bible, will you open with me to Luke, the Gospel of Luke? Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. As you're turning there, um, just want to say thank you to Johnny for the invite. Um, as he mentioned, I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a dad of three kids. They're in the back, so if you hear them, they're mine. Um, we have a fourth coming in about a month. Um, yeah, thank you, Lord. And they'll all be under four years old, so that's, that's going to be a, a fun adventure for us all. Um, I, I, do pri- I have the privilege of, of pastoring a church in Carpinteria. How many of you guys have been to Carpinteria? A couple, a few? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how many visitors we get from down here. So, um, it's, it's really good to be with you guys. I feel a bit of an outsider. I've never been here. I uh, went to a different Christian college. Um, I ran in very different um, ministry circles. Um, and it was, it was in a season of, of some intense trial and difficulty in my own life and ministry that people from this very school, people from your school, uh, reached out to me and encouraged me and provided some like essential encouragement and support through a a really tough season and the Lord has so um, opened my heart to you guys and to this school and this institution and the ministries represented here. So it it is beyond an honor to be with you and to open the word of God with you. Um, So we will be in Luke chapter one and we're gonna look at verses 13 to 17 and I'm uh, calling this this message, true greatness, true greatness. Let me read and pray one more time and then we will dig in. Luke chapter one, verse 13. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will not drink any wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit that inspired it and breathed it, that is with and in us now. Spirit of God, we ask that you would illuminate this text that you would open our eyes to behold the wonderful things here, and above all, that you would show us Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know about you, but, but I wanna be used by God. I wanna be used for the glory of God. I want my life to count. I wanna make it to the end of my life. I wanna stand before the almighty God And hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And and few things spur me on and encourage me like observing other great men and women. I don't know if that's true for you, but if you watch a a good movie, you read a good biography, you you know someone in your life who's truly great, nothing kind of spurs me on than just watching someone who is truly great. Even, even in sports, I, I just sometimes watch Kobe Bryant highlights just to be like, yeah, okay, come on. For the glory of God, if this guy cared this much about basketball, what in the world am I doing with my life? Nothing spurs me like watching great men. And one of the greats, he would make it on the Mount Rushmore of the greatest of all time, In fact, in Jesus' words, there was no one greater than this man. One of the greats was John the Baptist. And in our text, God provides us with essential insight into the, the greatness of John. What made John great? What made him great? And as we begin to look at his life, there's, this is the most important thing I'll say all morning. This is the most important thing. You can tune out, I don't even, I won't be too sad if you hear this. 
as we, as we want to look at the greatness of John, there's, there's one key to understanding it. And, and then we'll, we'll see it fleshed out, but there's one key. Look with me at verse 13. And the angel Gabriel is saying to Zechariah, your prayer, and what's those words, has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. Now, I have a question. Do, do we have any English majors here? English majors, a couple? Yeah, no? Do you guys have English majors here? No? No English majors? Just, okay, uh, any smart people who did well in grammar in high school in here? Okay, what, what kind of verb is in verse 13? What, your, your prayer has been heard. What's that called? Anybody know? A passive verb. A passive verb, that's right. You guys are smart. Um, the, a passive verb is a verb in which the subject undergoes the action of the verb, okay? So here's, here's the question, here's the key to this text. Who has heard the prayer? God. Who heard the prayer? God. Okay, there's, there's, a, there's an essential key here. And, and Luke actually sets it forth in the, in the very first verse of his gospel. It's actually the key to his whole book in the very first verse. There's another passive verb. It's a theme in the gospel of Luke. Look at verse one with me. In as such as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things that what? Have been fulfilled. That's another passive verb, okay? This is important. This is very important. Who is the main character in the Gospel of Luke? God. God is. And he has sent his son to accomplish the great plan of salvation. And so when we study someone in this book, like John the Baptist, for example, we need to know who made John great? Who made him great? God did. In fact, this whole book is a story. In fact, you, you go into Acts, like Johnny was talking about. Do you know, you know who the great main character is in the book of Acts? It's Jesus. Jesus is building his church. God is fulfilling his purposes in the world. And so when we wanna study a great man like John the Baptist, we need to give credit to where credit is due. It, it's, it, it's, it goes to God. God made John great. And so when we consider Okay, well, well what, how did God make John great? We just have to keep it in mind. God did this. God did this. God is what made John great. God is, is the actor here. And, and one more kind of grammar, and then we'll move on from grammar, and you, you don't have to pay as close attention. In, in verses 13 to 17, there are eight, eight future tense verbs because God is the actor and God is promising, I will do this through John. I will do this through John. I will do that through John. I will do that through John. I will do that through John. And so when we think about, God, I wanna be used by you, what we ought to remember is it is God who makes us great. It is God who has set the good works before us in advance that we would walk in them. And so we need to keep our eyes fixed on God. And, and even as we study the lives of great men in the Bible, in history, around us, it is God who gets all the credit. So with that in mind, that's the key to understanding this text. We're gonna see of those eight uh, future verbs, and I'm gonna fly, we're gonna see eight aspects of the greatness of John, eight ways in this text, God has made John great. You guys ready? You'll, you'll wake up as we go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get moving. Here we go. Number one, what made John great was a supernatural birth. A supernatural birth. Look at verse 13. The angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. Now, if you back up a few, you learn that Zachariah and Elizabeth are very old. Very old. And it's impossible physically for them to have a child. In fact, Elizabeth lived her whole life with a barren womb. She couldn't have a child. And if you were in the Jewish culture, that, that, that was a bigger deal than it is today. Today you don't have a child. People are like, oh man, you're free. You get to enjoy your life. In the Jewish culture, if you didn't have a child, it was, it was disgraceful for you. You lived your life full of shame. And this was a godly couple. They loved the Lord, yet they, they had no child. And that's actually a theme in Scripture. You may know that, right? What, what other godly couples come to mind that can't have children? We think of Abraham and Sarah. You may you think of Isaac and Rebecca, even Jacob and Rachel. We think of um, Hannah, the, the mother of Samuel. There, there's this theme in the Bible where women can't have children, and God steps in, and he provides a miracle. And why does he do that? Because that child will be great. 
God's gonna do something unique and special through that child. Now, I wanna be used by God. I, I imagine you wanna be used by God. And you're thinking, well, you know, I guess I'm disqualified. My parents, you know, had me the regular way. I wasn't a supernatural birth. I, maybe God can't use me. But I wanna remind you that you, if you are a Christian, have undergone a more miraculous birth than John the Baptist. The new birth is a greater miracle than a natural miraculous birth. Did you know that? Did you know it is more incredible for the God of the universe to take a heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh that loves God? That's a greater feat than him overcoming a barren womb. Did you know that? Do you know that if you want to be great, well, let me just say this, you need a new birth. You need a new birth. You need to be born again. You need the spirit of God to take your heart of stone that wants to do what you want to do and it needs to make it soft and, and supple and in love with God and his word. That's step number one, to be truly great in the eyes of the Lord. Now number two, John the Baptist had a significant name. Look with me again at verse 13. The angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife will bear you a son and you will call his name John. Now, remember in the Garden of Eden, before the fall, Adam had a special job. Remember that job? What was his job? He was to name the animals, right? Why do you think that was? Just like busy work, you know, hey, all right, get to work. You know, God wants Adam to feel, all right, I can accomplish something. No, that was... Um, that was the way that Adam practiced the, the call to have dominion over the earth. He was beginning to exercise his role to have dominion. To name something is, is to, in some sense, have authority over it. Now, there are six times in the Bible when God takes the job of naming a child away from the parents, away from the father in particular, and God says, not th this one, I'm, name I'm naming this child. I'm gonna name this child. There's six times. Number one, Isaac, also supernatural birth, right? And does anyone remember what Isaac's name means? Laughter, one who laughs. The next one was Solomon. God named Solomon. His name means peace. The next one was Josiah, King Josiah. That means one who heals. And it's wonderful. God is, before he's born, saying, this one I will send to restore, revive my people. The fourth one is fascinating. It's a secular king. Hundreds of years in advance, the king Cyrus, whom God used to go send the people out of exile to rebuild the temple, God named Cyrus in advance. And he's saying, yeah, Cyrus is gonna be my vessel. He will be uh, used by me. And then there are two more people in the Bible who are personally named by God. One is Jesus and the other is John the Baptist. Now, I never knew this until I studied this text, but do you know what the name John means in Hebrew? It means Yahweh is gracious. Yahweh is gracious. For 400 years, the people of God were in a disappointing situation. Other worldly kings were ruling over them. Their temple was destroyed. Their temple was built by some pagan named Herod. No prophecy, no movement of God. They're waiting for God. 400 years go by. And then finally, an angel shows up to a dad and he has a name for the son. And the son, the first time that Yahweh speaks again is, is this child will be called Yahweh is gracious. That marks what is about to happen in history and the gospel of Luke and the coming of Christ. What is God up to? What, is, what makes John so great? Well, he got to come and proclaim, even by his own birth and name, God is gracious. He's coming back for his people. Number three. Third thing that made John the Baptist great was what I'm calling it singular joy. Look at verse 14. And you will have joy and gladness. You. Uh, the English language is a little difficult because we don't know if that's plural or singular and our, our friends from the South perfected this by the invention of the word y'all. And so they say you for you and y'all for y'all. Um, what, what Gabriel's saying here is you singular, you Zachariah, I'm talking about you. You will have joy and gladness. 
you will have joy. Do you know what that means? That means God actually notices and he cares about individuals. He cares about this couple. He cares about their suffering. He cares about their trials. No individual escapes the notice and the care of God. Not a sparrow falls without the care of our God. And John's birth was a gift of joy to his immediate family. I mean, this is, maybe this is a cheap shot, maybe not, but do you wanna be great in the eyes of God? Bring joy to your parents. Bring joy to your family. But not only is it singular joy, number four, it's shared joy, shared joy. He goes on in verse 14, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Many. Well, who's that many? And, and, and you notice three times in this verse, joy, gladness, rejoicing. What is the cause of all this joy and rejoicing and gladness? It's bigger than just a wonderful miracle for a couple who couldn't have a child. John's birth, his arrival, it, it marked the arrival of another baby. It marked the arrival of another baby. The last uh, prophet to speak before 400 years of silence, Malachi chapter three, verse one, God says, behold, I am going to send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And so what the people of God are waiting for, they're actually, before they're waiting, they're expecting their Messiah, they're actually waiting for a messenger, a forerunner, a, a baby, a child, a, a man who will, who will announce the coming of the Messiah. And so what brings all this joy and gladness to the many? John's birth indicates that God is sending the Messiah, that God is coming for us. And, and I, I, want us to I just wanna point out one, one thing here. It struck me. We wanna be great. We, wanna, we want to make disciples. We want to do the work of evangelists, right? Wherever God is calling you, wherever you end up after you graduate, even now. We, we, part of greatness, we know this, is we're gonna see it in John the Baptist. We, we want people to hear about Jesus. And it just is striking to me that what leads the way in the coming of the Messiah, what leads the way in the coming of the forerunner is joy and gladness and rejoicing. Does the note of joy lead the way in your evangelism? Does the, 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 does the, the note of joy and gladness mark your life? When, when you show up, is it better that you're there? How beautiful are the feet, right, of those who bring good news? Your very presence, if you are a Christian, ought to produce joy because when, when you show up, do you know who's coming next? Jesus is coming next. That's your role. You go before him. You prepare people to meet with Jesus. And so joy leads the way, even in the birth and existence of John the Baptist. Why are we, well, what makes us joyful? Do we just have to muster it up like it's something that good Christians do? No, we have a real reason to be joyful. In fact, it's a theme throughout all of this gospel. I mean, look with me even just to chapter two. We have a bunch of shepherds doing their thing out at night. Nothing fun or joyful ever happens for a shepherd at night. Maybe just a wolf they have to fight off. And they're sitting there in verse nine, it says, an angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you what? Good news of what? Great joy for who? For all the people. Well, why? What's, what's so good about it? What's the joy coming from? Verse 11, for today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. Do you know what has the capacity to bring you greater joy than anything else in this life? It's your savior, Christ the Lord. Recognizing that you were a, a, a sinner born in sin, under the wrath of God, a, a child of wrath, the object of of the holy, just wrath of God. And by a sheer 
gift of God. He sent a savior to bear that wrath, the wrath that you justly deserved. It was yours. It was what you, the debt you should have paid. And the son of God lives a perfect life and he takes your place on the cross and the wrath of God is poured out on him and he dies and is raised and whoever would trust in him, there's really good news for you. The wrath of God is no longer over you. It's on Christ. The blood of the lamb is over you and you are an object of the affection and mercy and grace of God. Nothing produces more joy than recognizing that. David called it the joy of my salvation. When he was going through it, when he was in sin, what did he ask God to do? Restore to me the joy of my salvation. You struggle with discouragement. Keep looking to Christ. The joy of your salvation in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Number five, we see that John the Baptist was great because he was seen by God, seen by God. Verse 15, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. True greatness is measured by God and no one else. True greatness is measured by God. True greatness is greatness before God, before the eyes of God. Why was John great in the eyes of God? It wasn't his wealth. It wasn't his college degree. You were probably more educated than John the Baptist was. It wasn't his important or official role in some institution, in the temple, in politics. In fact, the, the elite hated him. He wasn't dressed well. He didn't eat well. He didn't look great. His ministry actually had a rapid decline. If you, if you charted his success, went like this, and then his ministry just petered out. All his best disciples left him, and he ended in jail, beheaded, with his head presented on a platter before a pagan king. What made him great? Why was John great? You know, I, I don't tend to think about John as my role model in life. I don't tend to think about John when I, I, I I'd rather watch Kobe Bryant than John the Baptist. When I want to think about greatness, what made him great? Well, he fulfilled the role given to him by God. And that role was actually the, 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 the most privileged role in, in that's ever been handed out to someone. He got to be the best man at the wedding when Christ came for his bride. He got to be the forerunner to announce Jesus is coming. He got to spend his best years preparing people for Jesus. That is greatness in the eyes of God. Six, we see that John was calling it spirit-filled, spirit-filled. Verse 15, he will be great in the, uh, in the sight of, of the Lord and he will not drink any wine or strong drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. There's this contrast that comes up often in scripture about alcohol and the spirit of God. Ephesians chapter five, verse 18, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. John was Spirit filled. This guy had the Spirit of God on him as a, what do you call it when you're in your mother's womb? A fetus, a, a baby. I mean, he was, he was a few cells multiplied and the Spirit of God was on him. Another way we could describe the person of John the Baptist is, is he was holy. He was holy. There's a, a couple uh, Old Testament allusions here that help a little bit. In Leviticus chapter 10, you may uh, be familiar with this story of Nadab and Abihu, and they, uh, they were servants of God, they were sons of the priests, and they were worship leaders, and they decided, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna make this worship service a little more exciting than how God ordained it to be, and so they came up with their own way of worshiping, and as they went, nice and proud of themselves, fire or lightning came out from the Holy of Holies, struck them dead on the spot. 
struck him dead on the spot. And in that chapter, God goes on to tell and warn the priests, hey, there will be no alcohol for my servants while they are serving in the temple. And you may remember, who was John's dad? Well, it was Zechariah. He was a priest. John the Baptist was in a priestly line. He served a priestly function in some ways. And then there's another story that this brings to mind. You may remember the prophet Samuel, right? One of the greatest prophets ever. And he was born of a supernatural birth and his mom made a vow that for all his life he would not cut his hair and he would never drink alcohol. It was a Nazarite vow. And so John the Baptist is this kind of combo of a, of a priest, a lifelong priest and a lifelong Nazarite. And so he'll never drink any wine. And so we can often get a little sidetracked with this. We're like, well, so should Christians never drink wine? And how do we think about wine? And, and, and you know the answer to that. The Bible says don't get drunk and don't break the law. And it also says don't be legalistic and add things to the Bible. But what's the point here? The point here is that John was holy. That's really the point. Even when we think about alcohol or whatever maybe Christian liberty we may have, the question is not what can I get away with, how much can I get? The question is how holy can I be? How pure of a vessel can I be? I want to be used by God. I want to be an honorable vessel. And we see a direct correlation in the scriptures to holiness and usefulness in the hands of God. See, direct correlation. So the Bible exhorts us time and time again, cleanse yourself, put off your sin, be holy. That's what it actually is to be filled with the Spirit. What is it to be Spirit-filled? It's to be holy. It's to put off your flesh and to walk as a holy vessel useful to God. I want to be useful. I want to be great in the eyes of God. And so that means I need to make my holiness a priority. Seven, two more. You guys with me? You guys okay? All right. What time? We got, we got some time. Number seven, he was sovereignly helped. Sovereignly helped. Look at verse 16. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Now, I want to balance an earlier point. Your life, your evangelism, your time with unbelievers ought to be marked by joy. And do you know what else it ought to be marked by? A call for them to repent. A call for them to repent got to be the most joyful person and the most honest. Hey, you need to turn from your sin. You need Jesus. You're going to stand before God one day. Are you prepared to die to meet the Lord? And that's one of the most loving things we can do. Joyful, holy, full of love, full of affection. And yet we say, you need to turn from your sin. You have to turn from your sin. And that was really the chief role God had for John the Baptist. What does a great man's life look like? He's turning people from their sin and turning them back to God. Go back, turn back to God. You know, at verse um, 17, one more thing before we look at our, our eighth point. It says, he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. You know, one of the problems with Israel, and, and it's a temptation for, for students like you, who many of you likely grew up in a good Christian home and you're at a good Christian school, is this assumption like I'm in. I've just always been in. Uh, like turn from what? I've never been out there. I've never, I've never done that stuff. What do I need to turn from? That was, that was Israel's tendency too. They just assumed Well, we're God's chosen people. I mean, we're not like those pagan nations out there. Turn from what? We're we're in, I'm in. And so uh, Elijah, probably the greatest prophet, his whole ministry was, you all need to turn back to God. Don't assume you're just okay because of who your parents are, because what ethnicity you are. You need to turn back to God. I, I I wanna say that honestly to all of you guys. You all have to turn to God and from your sin. There's there's no other way. And so Elijah proclaimed a message of repentance, of turning, and we have recorded for us in Scripture that mind-boggling story where he calls all the prophets up on a mountain. He says, okay, you want another God? 
You, the people of God, you want to serve another God? And that showdown happens and he taunts them and he has them. How's your God's working out for you? How is this idol worship going for you? And, and their idol doesn't respond. And then we know he douses his altar with water and God answers with fire. And then Elijah goes and he kills with the sword all the false prophets. It's pretty extreme, right? What's that all about? Because it is that significant to turn back to God a false idol that's turning your heart somewhere else or whatever idol it may be, it needs to be slain. It needs to be put to death. It needs to be turned from. It's serious. And so Elijah's ministry was marked by going to religious people and saying, you need to turn to God. Turn from your self-righteousness, from trying to earn God's favor, from trying to think that you can do it in your own strength. No, you need to turn from your sin, from your righteousness, and turn to God. And so that was John the Baptist's role. And as he did that, we, we get to our eighth point that made him great. He was sent before the Savior. Sent before the Savior. We don't only say to people, stop sinning, turn away from that, we, we point them to Jesus. There's something better for you. There's a savior for you. There's one who can satisfy you, who can justify you, who can cleanse you, who can sanctify you. His name is Jesus. And so verse 17 goes on to say, he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children, the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Prepared for the Lord. The greatest privilege, the greatest quality of John the Baptist was that he prepared people to meet Jesus. He prepared them for Jesus. His life, his greatness, his ministry, all these amazing things God did and proclaimed and prophesied over him, it was all to prepare people for Jesus. And so John was the greatest man born among women, as Jesus said. But there's, there's still someone greater than John. There was another who came after him, and that's Jesus. And so I just want to encourage and exhort us, you, be sure that you are born again. Be sure you're born again. Why pursue all your goals and dreams in life and, and forsake your soul? And may you bring with you the good news and joy wherever you go, wherever you end up, however you serve the Lord, even now as you serve the Lord as students, as friends, as sons and daughters. May, you, may you, your ambition be to be great in the eyes of God. Great in the eyes of God. Maybe not in the eyes of man. It's okay. Eternity is a lot longer than this life. We want to be great in the eyes of God. May you pursue holiness so that you can be useful to your master. May you boldly proclaim, full of love and joy, the need to repent, to turn from sin to God. And above all, may Jesus receive all the glory, all the glory in everything that you do. So God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for John who went before us, a man who you made great. He was yours, he was your chosen instrument with a specific job to point people to Christ. And Lord, that is, that's, that is my prayer for these students even now, that we would make it our ambition to be great in your eyes, to be useful in your hands, so that the world will come to know Jesus, that they'll be ready, prepared for his return, to meet him, to see him face to face. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Christ. You are the greatest who has ever come, and you laid your life down for us. And so, as recipients of your salvation, with joy, we thank you. We say together, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.